afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming out on a little bit of a rainy day. We're really glad to have you here at Connecticut's Old State House for another installment of Conversations at Noon. My name is Rebecca Tabor Conover. I'm head of public programs here, and we're really delighted to have you here with us today. I think you're going to really enjoy today's program on exploring Connecticut in the slave trade. We've got some wonderful, wonderful speakers today. Um, before we get started, I wanted to just ask two favors of you. All of you should have surveys on your seats. We actually really use these, and we're getting ready to plan for the next year or so of programs. So any ideas or suggestions you have for us, we'd really welcome them. So please take a second to fill these out at the end of the program, and myself or any other staff members would be happy to take them. And then the, um, the other thing I just wanted to alert you to is that it's spring, finally, after this winter, and we're going to celebrate spring on May the 19th with a conversation on noon that is entitled Hartford Blooms, the Greening of a City, which will be all about the movement of urban gardens and will get us all in the mood for spring and summer. And um, without further ado, I'm really pleased to introduce my colleague at the Connecticut Network, who's our, um, in charge of our programming, and her name is Diane Smith, and she is going to be hosting us and uh, directing our panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you for coming today. And um, for anyone that you know that might be interested in this program and did not have an opportunity to come downtown to the Old State House, I want you to know that the show is being taped by the Connecticut Network. It will be available on television, and it will also be available permanently online so that people can watch it on demand on our website, which is ct n Com. So let me just start out with an introduction. Um, I have to say that for some of us, including me, Anne Farrow was the person who opened my eyes to the history of slavery in Connecticut. It all started with a story in the Hartford Current that eventually led to a book that was titled Complicity, How the North Promoted, Prolonged, and Profited from Slavery. It was written by Anne and two of her colleagues. That book shook up a lot of people in the state. I remember all of the controversy in the newspaper after the article first appeared. Because so many of us believed that slavery was an evil confined to the South. For the last decade, Anne has explored the content and the meaning of logbooks that she discovered from a slave ship that sailed from New London to Sierra Leone in 1757. The books were kept by the son of a wealthy and prominent Connecticut merchant, and I am certain that many of you are going to recognize his family name. It's familiar to many of us. He was on board the ship on a training voyage and then took several more voyages. Here's a little something that um, was written about the book uh, that came out of Anne's research, and um, this is the book. It's called The Log Books, Connecticut's Slave Ships and Human Memory. And by the way, if you'd like copies, um, Anne will be in the gift shop when this is over. She'll be able to sign copies. And our other two speakers today have also written some wonderful books, and they have some copies as well. But let me tell you about this. It says, The Log Books explores that voyage of that young man and two others that were documented by him to unearth new realities of Connecticut's slave trade and question how we could have forgotten this part of our past so completely. But there's more. There is a personal narrative in the book as well. When Anne began her research into the logbooks in 2004, her mother had just been diagnosed with dementia. As Anne observed the way memory loss affected her mother's own sense of herself, she also began a journey into the world of the logbooks and the Atlantic slave trade. As the story unfolds in the logbooks, Anne explores the idea that if our history is incomplete, then collectively we have forgotten who we are, a loss that is in some ways similar to what her own mother experienced in the last years of her life. This book and Anne's journey in researching and writing it are fascinating. Ann Farrow was a writer and editor at the Hartford Current for 20 years. She is currently a writer and a researcher for Connecticut Museums. Please join me in welcoming Ann Farrow. Thank you so much, Diane. Uh, this picture that will be uh, up during my talk and today is a picture of the ruins on Bents Island, which is in Sierra Leone, West Africa. Uh, this, this island and its ruins are, are largely the subject of my book. 
Thank you so much again, Diane, for that wonderful introduction. I am honored to be here and to have this opportunity to speak about my work. My new book was published last fall by Wesleyan University Press and is an exploration of a set of logbooks from several Connecticut slave ships. These ships sailed from New London to the west of Africa in the middle of the 18th century, and they tell a story that most of us probably have not thought about or known, that Connecticut men were directly involved in the slave trade in Africa, and that they traded for and transshipped black men, women, and children from their homes in West Africa to English islands in the Caribbean, where they worked and died in permanent exile growing sugar. Each of us tells our story within the context of the life we are given. Ten years ago, I was a reporter at the Hartford Current and at work with two colleagues on a different book about slavery in New England when I first saw the ship's logbooks that changed my life. In the spring of 2004, a friend sent me a copy of a newspaper article published in the Hartford Times in 1928. The article described the logbooks of three slaving voyages bound together in a single volume. The logbooks described two voyages from New London to West Africa and one voyage from West Africa to an island in the Caribbean. All the voyages were made between January of 1757 and August of 1758. The tone of the newspaper article was one of cheerful bonhomie and brave Connecticut mariners. The idea of Connecticut men commanding slave ships was new to me, despite my state's proximity to Rhode Island, which may have been colonial America's largest transporter of slaves to the Caribbean and the colonies. At the time my friends sent me the newspaper article, I had been studying slavery in Connecticut and New England for almost two years and understood that colonial Connecticut had been a major provisioner of the British West Indies plantations where captive people were growing and processing sugar in a monoculture that yielded huge profits to England. When I studied the customs records of colonial Connecticut ships sailing to and returning from the Caribbean and saw the newspaper advertisements for tropical products such as nutmeg and Madeira and raisins, I understood that this was the broad record of human enslavement and suffering. But I had not felt the information I was seeing. To be guided by empathy and to be changed, I had to cross the street. The Hartford Current's offices are almost within sight of the Connecticut State Library, where the ship's logs had been since their acquisition from the widow of a North Carolina collector in 1920. The 250-year-old ship's logs are fragile and stored in a temperature-controlled manuscript vault. So when I went to the State Library the first time to look at them, the librarian asked me if I would be willing to read them just on microfilm. Microfilm, as all researchers know, is hard to read. And as I tucked the end of the film strip into the spool, I wondered if I would even be able to decipher the 18th century handwriting. I worried that I didn't have enough background on the slave trade itself to understand what I would see. And indeed, it took me the better part of a decade to fully parse out what I saw on those 80 neatly written pages. But on page 38 of what appeared to be the second voyage in the logbooks, the logbook keeper noted on Wednesday, April 13th, 1757, on board the Good Hope, lying at Bent's Island, taking in rice, slaves, wood, and water. Similar entries appear for the next several days. Though I was confused about many of the terms and had no idea where Bent's Island might be because it is so small that it does not appear on any modern maps, I understood that taking in slaves meant trading for human beings and putting them on a ship. I was about to make a journey of my own into these log books, and I would learn that of the dozens of slaving castles that once dotted the West African coast, tiny bents may have sent as many Africans into southern colonial slavery as any other single outpost. And then it vanished from the world's memory, 
The jungle claimed the tall walls of the fortress, and trees grew up in the roofless yards where the captives had once been held in the hundreds for sale. The free black workers who had been employed by the British to work the fortress on bands moved farther upriver to a remote estuary and went back to growing rice. Even my early tentative identification of the log keeper as a man named Samuel Gould vanished and was replaced by more compelling evidence that surfaced and pointed to an aristocratic colonial named Dudley Saltonstall as the narrator of the tale. For almost 80 years, the log books sat on the shelf at the State Library waiting to tell their story. Their challenge to me has been to use them correctly and ethically in portraying a traumatic past. And at the very moment when I was beginning to excavate and study this complicated history, my mother, who had been diagnosed with dementia, plunged forward into the profound memory loss and disorientation that marked the last few years of her life. It seemed like my whole life was about the past and about memory. And yet this research into historical memory and my care of my mother seemed to dovetail. I was asking questions of New England history and finding the answers in my mother's life. What does it mean not to know your own past? How does that harm you? How successfully can you function in the present if you don't know who you are? To help myself understand, I began to read about memory formation and to imagine memory as a kind of platform, one to which lengths of wood can be added to make it larger. A good platform is a stable structure with many separate boards combining to make a whole, and a well-made platform can support objects of varying weight and significance while it also makes room for them. My mother's memory platform had lost objects that varied in size and importance. Her long and tender marriage, her children, her life skills as a homemaker and secretary all tumbled from the platform, and the disparity between the truths she had once known about, about herself and the loss of those truths made her unable to function with independence and clarity. But in helping to care for her, I saw connections to my country's history. From America's memory platform, I believe that many realities also have fallen. The national narrative about how our country was founded, then prospered and moved forward, does not give slavery the major place it actually held. Slavery was not the sad chapter in an otherwise glorious trajectory. I believe that slavery was not a chapter at all, but the book itself. Early on, mother began to have trouble recognizing me. And in fact, I had expected her to forget who I was, but I had not understood that she would also forget who she was. Without a stable memory of the events of her long life, with neither a past that she could remember nor a future she could imagine, she drifted in the present, each day seeking a coherent explanation as to whom she might be. Without a personal history to center her and give her purpose, she began her unfamiliar life over again every day in the supervised residence she called simply the place. Visiting her one evening, I told her, I'm going to Africa to see the island where the man who kept the ship's logs bought captive people. I explained to her that I needed to see the island and walk in its ruins and to stand where human beings had been bought and sold. I told her that the island had been abandoned for two centuries and was considered a haunted place. With the support, the wonderful support, I should say, of the Hartford Current, I traveled to Sierra Leone, West Africa, and visited the Bence Island of my logbooks for several weeks in November of 2004. I visited other islands that were also part of the 18th century slave trade archipelago described in the logbooks and saw at first hand the landscape of the slave trade. I thought before our panel begins that I would read you just a few pages from the book. Because it was an important island within the international system of the slave trade, many Europeans visited Benz. Anna Maria Falconbridge was a young English woman married to an abolitionist who had been a physician on board British slave ships. 
She visited Bents Island several times in the early 1790s, and when she visited the island village where the black workers lived, she commented that their homes were quite clean and neat and that they greeted her respectfully. Anna Maria was younger than her volatile husband, abolitionist Alexander Falconbridge, and she did not share his deep hatred of the slave trade. In the book that she wrote about her experiences in Africa, she was frank about her disgust with his drinking and his temper. A few weeks after his death, she married a man who was connected to the slave trade, and she left Sierra Leone forever but she seems to have enjoyed her visits to Bents Island and found the anti-slavery endeavor that had brought her and her husband to Sierra Leone ill-advised. After waving her husband off to a day of dealing with whites and African traders, Anna Maria would settle in for a day of socializing with company agents and traders at the fortress. She also took guided tours around the island and included in her narrative novelistically precise vignettes of the Africans she met. On one of her island walks, Anna Maria visited the graveyard of the white men who had died on the island, and she noted that the quiet grove was shaded by orange trees. On my last visit to the island, we went there too. There are no longer orange trees around the graveyard, but the area had been cleared for us and I saw the grave of a Danish sea captain, as well as that of a slave trader named William Cleveland. My logbook keeper mentioned Cleveland when Captain Cleveland sailed past the Africa on March 29, 1757, in a schooner with 30 captive people on board. A widely known trader and successful Cleveland owned substantial properties in the West Indies, and he died in 1758 on Bents Island. Seeing William Cleveland's grave and remembering the logbook entry that had mentioned him made a stone drop in my heart. A piece of 18th century paper archived in Hartford, Connecticut, had led me to a grave on an abandoned island in West Africa. This was the connection I had wanted to make to let the past speak through me and to be its instrument. Using sheets of handmade paper and graphite that I had brought from home, I tried to trace the words from the grave of Thomas Knight, an Englishman who had supervised slave trading on Bents Island for 18 years. Anna Maria Falconbridge had visited the same, the same grave during her visit in 1791. All of the headstones were rough tilting and in poor condition. In the heat of midday, the stick of graphite was melting onto my hands before I could rub it cleanly against the paper, and I couldn't get a clear image of the lettering on the stone. I finally gave up and pulled the rice paper away from Knight's grave and saw that only one word was even faintly legible. Memory. Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, and thank you for um, come on up to our panel. And um, students, I'm so glad that you were all able to join us. Thank you for being with us today. We're happy to have you. And I'd like to uh, introduce um, the two other members of our panel who have uh, a lot to share with us as well. Um, Lois Brown, who is uh, right there, is um, the Class of 1958 Distinguished Professor at Wesleyan University. Now, I should say, that doesn't mean you were in the Class of 1958, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> No, no, I have a very nice face cream. <laughs> You're very well preserved. <laughs> Lois is uh, the distinguished professor at Wesleyan University where she chairs the African American Studies program and is a faculty member in English. Her research and teaching focus on 18th and 19th century New England and African American literary history and culture and on the politics of memory, identity, and place. 
She is the editor of the first modern edition of the 1835 memoir of James Jackson, the earliest known work of African American biography. Currently, she is at work on a biography of Nancy Prince, the 19th century New Englander who published the first African American travel narratives. Also joining us and back for a, a second appearance, uh, I think we talked to you earlier in your work as you were working on um, your book, um, is Allegra D. Bonaventura. She is an assistant dean at the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at Yale University. Her 2013 book, For Adam's Sake, A Family Saga in Colonial New England, won the New England Historical Association's James P. Hanlon Book Award and the Association for the Study of Connecticut's History of Connecticut History's Homer D. Babbage Award. And, and thank you all three of you for being with us today. It's thank wonderful you. to have you. you. I thought as we were preparing for this event today, there have been several things happening lately that just seem to coincide with this discussion about memory and about the slave trade. One of them being, which was just in the news over the weekend, um, Ben Affleck. Uh, who was uh, being profiled in a PBS documentary that takes famous people and looks into their background, their genealogy there, and tells them about their ancestry. And apparently what was revealed as part of his ancestry was that um, some of his ancestors were slaveholders. And uh, the WikiLeaks um, dump of documents over the weekend showed that the, he asked that that not be included in his biography and that there was some back and forth with the producer of the program and whether that would, um, editing that program would be a problem for the integrity of PBS and the show. The other thing that came up um, not too long ago was the discovery of a slave market in New York City near Wall Street and the uh, New York City Council's decision to erect a monument um, to remember where that market was. And I just thought maybe we could comment on those two things just for a little bit before we get into some of these other issues. Um, and that is, um, as I was reading about the slave market near Wall Street, it said that the Dutch settlers who arrived to settle New York came with captive slaves. Lois, I didn't know that. There's a lot we don't know, and a lot we should. Um, so much of the formation of this country depended on labor. Mm -hmm. and, um, and there were all sorts of, of strategic rationales developed in order to justify the, the uh, use of labor. So you even find in Massachusetts um, uh, a whole rhetoric about, well, it's not really slavery. If you fight a war and you win, and you take the captives, well then, you, then of course, uh, they're yours to do with as you would. So what we find is that slavery is everywhere. Enslavement is everywhere. And I think that's another important piece to stress is that this is a process. It's not that someone is born a slave. It is that they are enslaved by others. Mm -hmm. And that there are all of these really curious and um, problematic contracts, if you will, mm -hmm. that are essential to the formation of the America that we think we know. Allegra, uh, your book um, goes back into very early colonial New England, and yet, um, I, you know, this is even earlier, the, the slave trade or the slave market established in the Wall Street area, and, and I read that at, at, at one point, 40% of the white families in New York City owned slaves, 40%. Well, and that was true um, in some coastal towns in New England as well. And this, I think these two incidents that you've brought up also bring up, say a lot about where we are today mm -hmm. as well. And the continuing level, it's surprising almost of discomfort that, I mean, Ben Affleck, for instance, wanting to sort of edit out that part of his history, mm -hmm. which is certainly a history that we all as Americans have in common. and and. Could, there could be a benefit to us knowing more about that history, all sides. So um, yes, very much at the foundation of English American settlement and certainly Spanish American settlement as well. And I, I guess I wasn't surprised that Ben Affleck did not know about that part of his history. I certainly don't know a, a lot of the genealogy of my family. Um, but Anne, the fact that he wanted to erase that part once it became part of his history, I thought was problematic. I would, I would agree with you, and yet I think it also speaks to the fraught nature around slavery in America and how we think about this part of history. You know, he, uh, he wants 
for his past, and I haven't studied the situation a lot, but he, he's comfortable with his past, including a mother who was a freedom fighter and another relative who was a healer, but not the person who, like many other colonial Americans, held captive labor. Mm -hmm. And I think the greater problem, uh, apart from Ben Affleck being uncomfortable with his history, uh, is the erecting of a monument, as if, you know, as if somehow admitting that, yes, human beings were sold at the foot of Wall Street or wherever that monument is being put up. We can retire this into history and stop thinking about it. We don't really have to worry about the situation of the people who are descended from those early African Americans. We don't have to worry about their lives if we put up a monument and retire this into history. I see interesting parallels in, in post-World War II Germany. Mm -hmm. this monuments everywhere, mm -hmm. rather than saying, OK, how do we deal with this? Mm -hmm. How do we change the future? And in some ways, too, the question around the Ben Affleck situation is not in some ways, the, what happens to the integrity of the show? It's why don't you want that story? What is it about that story that makes you feel shame? That makes you want to run away? Um, what is it you think you know about slavery and enslavement and captives and profit? And what kind of work do you think that is going to make you? have to do as an American, as someone who's descended from that and benefited from it? What work is it that you're not interested in doing? And I think that then gets to the conversation about, well, we now recognize, we have had a ceremony, and now we proceed. But the irony of the market in Wall Street should not be lost on us, mm -hmm. of course. Um, and that should underscore for us that, that the history of enslavement truly is here, right? I also want to say, if anyone would like to make a comment or ask a question, please raise your hand, and we'll bring a microphone over to you. Um, oh, we have people already. Um, who has the mic? You do? OK, great. Right up here in the front. You know, I realized I took your water. Do you think okay. Yeah, In the North, I hadn't heard that there was any slavery in the North. But in the North, was it all permanent slavery, or was some of it like indentured servants who would eventually earn their freedom? Okay, that's interesting because there's a distinction between those two things. I would think, Allegra, would you like to start? Um, absolutely. So, uh, in the colonial period, there, certainly there were both indentured servants and enslaved people, really from the very earliest years of, of English settlement. Mm -hmm. um, so, there were both. And one person, one family, might move between different statuses over the course of their lives. So, I mean, in the, the folks that I studied around New London, Connecticut, for instance, they spent part of their lives as enslaved people, part of their lives as indentured servants, part of their lives as free people. So, um, and I should say, some kind of servitude, you know, uh, was very common throughout most classes of society. So it was common practice to apprentice for middle class, what we would call middle class people, to apprentice your child, for instance. That was normal. So moving through servitude was much more common in general. But, um, but enslavement, perpetual enslavement, also existed until actually the 1840s in, in Connecticut. In the South? In the North. In the South, it was always permanent. So I thought there was a lot of indentured servants in the South. But in the North, like, they came over from England, Ireland, to earn their freedom, to get away from family, and things like that. And they did it as an indentured servants. But what percent in the North were purely slaves that were always in the States? Were a small percent or almost? In terms of society, what percent of people were enslaved people in early New England, say pre-1750? It would have been, in terms of number, first I should say we don't have great, you know, the, the census didn't happen until a little later. So a lot of this is kind of historical guesswork. But um, historians have, have guessed that, um, say in Connecticut, which was one of the larger slaveholding New England states, maybe 2 to 3%. Um, 
But in a town like New London, Connecticut, for instance, a port town might be as high as 5% of the population. Well, again, the numbers are not, you know, we don't have exact figures, but, but African American people uh, say around, could have been around 5%, and some of whom might have been enslaved, some of whom were free people. Um, but certainly for the person on the ground in colonial New London, for instance, mm -hmm. ha in, in their local neighborhood, it would have been very common to, any, you know, in most of the households surrounding them, that there might be one or two or even more enslaved And Allegra, let's people. talk about that for a minute, because yeah. I think one of the stories that we've told ourselves when we do find stories like the one you told in your book, and I'll let you explain that a little bit first, or when we hear about Venture Smith and some of the slaves whose names we've come to know in Connecticut, um, we have this story that we believe that, well, they were just treated like a member of the family. They were, you know, kept in the house and they were treated well and everyone loved them and they were treated kindly. And tell me the story that you uncovered actually in colonial period. So I came to this topic through a, an incredible diary um, that some of you might be familiar with, the diary of Joshua Hempstead, who was a New Londoner from 1678 to 1758. And he left a 47, more than 47 year diary covering his life. And he was an ordinary man, a farmer and a shipwright. And in coming to know the diary and coming to know Joshua, I also came to know that he owned another New Englander, a man by the name of Adam Jackson. And my book is called For Adam's Sake because it really was for Adam that I ended up writing the book that I did. And Adam, like Joshua, was actually a third generation New Englander. So um, I, I was able to trace him back to his, his parents and even his grandmother back in the 1650s and 60s. And Adam's situation, I think, was probably fairly typical of a, a New England enslaved person. So he lived in the household. The household was rather, the house was very small. Joshua and Adam worked side by side for more than 30 years together. So there is some truth, not necessarily in terms of treated as family and those kinds of things, but, but the, the material constraints of everyday life in a colonial New England meant that there wasn't a great deal of separation between people. Um, so physically sleeping in the same area, eating in the same area, working in the same area. And that very much was the daily life for, for Adam Jackson and for his master, mm -hmm. uh, Joshua Hempstead. Mm -hmm. We often talk about the peculiar institution of slavery, and I think when we think about New England, it's a peculiar kind of intimacy because there is this proximity. We're not talking about large-scale plantation um, cultivation of rice, of indigo, of cotton. We're talking about much more specialized kinds of work. But I also want to think about the man named Fortune from Waterbury who had the misfortune to be enslaved to a man who was an early orthopedic doctor who was a bone setter named um, Preserved, can't make this up, Preserved <laughs> Proctor, right? And so you have Fortune who spends his life, he also is married to a woman um, who is enslaved and working, they have children, and when Fortune dies, the doctor says, I have a chance now to see the bones in full and to create a sample for myself that I can use to um, really specialize, become very much well-versed in my profession. And he proceeds in graphic detail to boil the body down to the bones. And that skeleton stays in that family, teaches generations of bone setters, um, at some point is in the attic and the children are playing with it. It ends up in the Mattituck Museum. And there is that conversation about how do we bury the unburied? What do we do and what name shall we call him? And so I think it's really important, and this goes to that comfort question, and we think about people in the proximity they have, it's no easy relationship at all, because you can treat someone and call them family, and then in the documents of the will, sell their child to your heirs and pass that child, it's not even selling, it's passing a child through generations for the extent of their natural life. And it also, just to finish this point, in terms of that question of how many people are slaves forever, once you are a person of African descent in a slaveholding country in, that is shaped by laws 
organized by people who have an investment in the business of enslavement, which it was, you are forever at risk. And so what we find are those you know, convenient laws that relegate people on one side of one date to 25 years of servitude or perpetual. But the last person emancipated in Connecticut was 1848, as I, I believe. Um, how far, the, the Civil War is practically knocking on the doorstep. So thinking about that peculiar intimacy and the license that people have to bodies that are brown and African in the wake of the fugitive slave laws, we have them in place well before 1850. And so somebody who is living free, like those populations in Boston, in Hartford, they are still subject. And their lives can be rewritten, renamed. They can be renamed. We saw that in 12 Years a Slave. I was just going to say Absolutely. 12 Years a Slave is a perfect example. Um, and you know, we, we talk about how um, so many people were not aware of slavery here in Connecticut. And yet, if you do just a small amount of research, we know that there were slaves who were petitioning the le state legislature very early on um, to be freed and were turned down and turned down. But which one of you can talk a little bit about that? Because that, I, I found that to be um, startling as I was studying some of the history of the state legislature. I think I, I can't speak exactly to the to the to those petitions because I haven't studied them. But I do know that in the uh, narrative of Venture Smith, which is widely available online at docsouth.org, um, Venture in his, and it's only perhaps 30 or 40 pages, he tells the story of his life as an enslaved and then a free man in Connecticut. And he talks about, and he was a, a prince in Africa, and he documents you know, being brought over here as a child and being, a, uh, he was held as a captive on, on Fisher's Island in the Narragansett region of Rhode Island. He was a captive in Stonington and managed finally to uh, uh, before the American Revolution to buy his own life back from the man who owned him and then he bought his sons and the three of them worked together to buy their mother and their sister, which I think is a, you know, that in this brave new world someone had to buy their own, their own existence and the existence of their family. But he talks eloquently about the nature of being a captive and he says, my freedom is a privilege nothing else can equal. And I commend his book, not only because it's so easy to read and so short and so available, but because, you know, it often is interpreted as a triumph narrative mm -hmm. because he did become free and he bought boats and he had houses and he had a lot of property uh, on the Connecticut River. But if you read his narrative, the bitterness of his experience and the, inequ the unequal way that he was treated, even as a free and propertied man, you know, he says, because I am an African, you know, I am the black dog, mm -hmm. that the bitterness of that experience is right there. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we had a question in the back there that I wanted to, sir, did you have a question? Yeah, Chris, would you bring in the mic, please? Uh, thank you very much. Well, first of all, my name is Malcolm Freeman, Jr. Um, I have a comment, actually. The first comment was for the Ben Affleck situation. Um, the first thing I think of is cognitive dissonance. I believe that that's what makes it difficult for him to acknowledge the fact that even though, you know, he had some people in his family that wanted to heal and, you know, had better thoughts in their mind, he still had, you know, slave traders in his family. That's cognitive dissonance when you just don't want to acknowledge something that's probably kind of negative in your life. When, like you said, it could be beneficial to explore it and probably grow from it. Um, as far as the, the, tra uh, the stock exchange thing that we're talking about, as far as I know, as far as I come to understand, slaves were one of the first stock on the stock exchange. So to me, what I glean, what the dots I connect from that is, you know, that's one of the, some of the industries that built this country, the fact that we were traded as stocks and that's how the system has grown. So I believe that is difficult to look at slavery and try to eradicate it when it's the system that built the country and brought it so much success, so to speak. So it's, it's a very strong cognitive dissonance on both of those fronts where people don't want to acknowledge it because it's just so detrimental to what has come from it. And I think, um, thank you, I think that's uh, what you said, Anne, in the book, and you mentioned it uh, today, 
that slavery was not a sad chapter in an otherwise glorious trajectory of the American colonies becoming this new nation. Not the chapter, but the book itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that speaks also to what Lois was saying. You know, we think of, of the uh, uh, white settlers, the English, coming here for religious freedom and to have say over their own lives. Um, but really and truly, the most pressing exigency of this new world was labor. Mm -hmm. There was a world to be created. And, and because we were, a, you know, an English colony and in the slipstream of Great Britain, which was at the very helm of the international slave trade, we quickly, I think, became a world that needed and was accustomed and then became addicted mm -hmm. to captive labor. And one of the things that, um, that I uh, was particularly struck with when you and I had a conversation this week was that... Um, Oh, we, we talked about slaves that were held in Connecticut. We talked about uh, people like Saltonstall, who was on a ship that actually went to go buy slaves and take them to the Caribbean, where they would work on these sugar plantations. But your feeling also is that all of the many people in Connecticut who benefited from trade with the Caribbean, and we know that that was big here, you know, that's at least part of the history that we do accept and that we do remember. We talk about nutmeggers and all that, um, that you hold them as accountable as those who actually bought, kidnapped and bought and sold the slaves? I think, I do. I think we need to think and study and, and, and take into ourselves the quality of life that those captive workers in the Caribbean lived. It was, and there are many scholars, many eminent people who have documented this, their life was, was a kind of hell on earth. They were brought from Africa, and they and their descendants, they were worked literally to death. Very, a very eminent scholar at, um, at Yale, David Brian Davis, has documented the fact that it was cheaper to bring a child or a person from Africa than to raise one from childhood in the Caribbean. And their labor was just so necessary. And they, and they, were, they were horribly treated. They were engaged in a, the sugar monoculture was, Adam Hochschild said, it, was, it is one of the hardest ways mm -hmm. of life on earth. It was dangerous. They were constantly humiliated, beaten, starved. Um, Alexander Hamilton, I read, he said that when he had grown up in the Caribbean and he would not own captive people because of what he had seen in childhood. Our association with the Caribbean is if we're lucky to go there for a vacation and it's like a paradise. But the English, and I haven't studied the French islands, but the English planters, that plantocracy, they made the Caribbean a, a kind of hell. It was acknowledged even then to be a kind of hell. And I think for um, the majority of us um, that have not yet, and our television audience as well, that has not yet had the opportunity to read the book, we should explain that some of what was happening here is that a lot of the wealth that came to Connecticut was a result of trade with the Caribbean because the, um, uh, the plantation owners and others um, needed what we raised here, what we grew here, what we, for the people who were there. Is that right? Absolutely. And I wanted to add also that Native Americans were mm -hmm. also swept up in this mm -hmm. English hunger for uh, captive labor in the colonial period. And also, Native, so Native Americans were enslaved. There were even Native Americans who were shipped to the Caribbean mm -hmm. as punishment for their participation in wars against the English, for mm -hmm. example. So uh, the, the, it, it wasn't just African Americans who were subject in this uh, consumption of labor in the, in the earliest period. And it wasn't just that we were, that, that uh, merchants here were bringing sugar and spices back from the Caribbean. It was that uh, farmers here were benefiting from growing crops and making textiles and what have you that went to the Caribbean in part to feed um, enslaved people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the most powerful pieces of Anne's book, where she talks about that provisioning mm -hmm. history, um, because it gives us a sense, again, of the fact that, it gives us a sense that there that slavery and enslavement was an enterprise. It wasn't a moral or amoral um, predilection. It wasn't an accident of history. 
It had everything to do with creating societies that ran, that enabled people to have power, to acquire goods, to influence policy, and to own, to own the world. In some ways, nothing has changed, right? In some ways, much has. But that focus, not on the moral dilemma of enslavement, but the economic imperatives, gives us a way to approach this really difficult topic and this, um, and this unwieldy history. Um, but I also want to say that it's right in front of us. It's right there. So one of the, you know, in my classes I teach um, Phyllis Wheatley's poem, and, and many of my students have read On Being Brought from Africa to America, a very short poem, which has been read historically as, well, you know, I, I, I found Jesus here, so it's really okay. But we reread it, and it becomes something very different. But there is another poem that she writes to the Secretary of State um, who, for North America, and she writes this long poem to him about diplomacy and politics. And she writes, and she says, you might wonder, sir, from whence my love of freedom sprung. And then she goes on, and I brought the lines with me, because I thought, if I have to read anything, this is what I would read. And it says, you, should you, my lord, wonder um, when you peruse my song, from whence my love of freedom sprung, whence flow these wishes for the common good, by feeling hearts also alone best understood. And she tells us, and this doesn't get told as often as it needs to, I, young in life, by seeming cruel fate, was snatched from Afric's fancied happy seat. What pangs excruciating must molest? What sorrows labor in my parents' breast? And here's the salt and stall piece, perhaps. Steeled was that son, and by no misery moved, that from a father seized his babe beloved. Such, such my case. That's Phyllis Wheatley's biography. That's her autobiography, where she says, someone came and took me from my father. How do we build all in the family from that? Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. And um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, something else that, um, that we discussed earlier, which is that um, there has been you had had originally identified uh, the uh, person that had written these logbooks as someone else and eventually came to find out who we now really believe who it was. Just give us a little bit of that journey, because it, go, it goes from someone who probably no one would have ever heard of to a name that we probably all know if we knew anything about Connecticut. Right. You know, like, like every uh, person who does history research, and I'm not deeply trained in historical research like Lois and Allegra, I was a journalist, you know, an investigator assigned to a story. But when I started to, the log books are not signed. Log books would, were not signed, typically. Often they were kept by the captain of the vessel. That where there was, and, and I won't go into it, but there's English law around that, or English uh, procedure. But this, log, this particular set of log books was three different logs, three different journeys with three different captains. So I started to show it to maritime experts, and, and several of them said, this was a private document, not one to be used in case of a later lawsuit or, or for the owner of the vessel or whatever. This was a private document, and it was probably kept by someone who was very young, because on the inside of the front cover, there are practice equations. This was before Greenwich Mean Time and being able to measure time and distance that way. So I started, look, you know, Connecticut, the thing about these logbooks is that they're relatively early. It's 1757. So to have been a young person on board this vessel, my logbook keeper would have had to have been born probably during the 1730s, maybe early 1740s. There weren't a lot of people who it could have been. Um, but there was a man named Samuel Gould, who was, he was the son of a farmer. He would have been 22. At the time of these log books, he was born in a town that was part of New, a, a county, that was part of New London County at the time, and he had another, there were, he had an older brother who, was, who died in the slave trade, a commander named Thomas Gould who died in Africa. His men mutinied on him and killed him. So, you know, I worked with handwriting experts, I looked at wills, I tried to find commonalities, and I wrote my project at, when I was at The Current and then left The Current to continue the work on the book. 
and a fellow scholar, a retired lawyer in Madison, who decided to get a master's degree and is studying, was studying the illegal slave trade between Connecticut and France during the Seven Years' War, when we weren't supposed to trade with the French, but of course we did trade with the French. He said, he and I, we got to meet each other and we exchanged some documents, and he was working on sort of that same population of people that I was. He said, I think you should investigate the possibility that your log book keeper may have been the son of Gurdon Saltonstall. And Gurdon was the son of the governor of, uh, and a very famous cleric also named Gurdon. He was a very successful businessman, merchant, and sort of the de facto mayor of New London. And, he all, and, and this other scholar had discovered that Gurdon owned two of the three ships in the log books. So I and in fact, I used Allegra's Joshua Hempstead diary as one of my confirming sources. He had a son. Gurdon had a son born in, uh, uh, well, I, can't, I guess he was born in 1739. He was, he was uh, just 18 at the time of the voyage. And, be, and because, so I proceeded from the idea that it might be this Dudley Saltonstall, because Dudley Saltonstall later became a very famous commander and trader and uh, an early commodore of the Continental Navy. There are examples, not all of them attributed, but there are many examples of his handwriting out there. So I, be I began to compare words and documents in the logbooks and uh, the many examples of there, uh, that are out there of his handwriting and um, was able uh, to make a positive identification that way. And also, I continued to study Dudley's life. And he stayed, although he was a mariner who also was in trade with the Caribbean and was a, a, a captain uh, and commodore in the Continental Navy, he also, it appears to me, stayed involved in the slaving trade until the end of his life. And I, I'll just tell one last piece, because I know time is limited. But after I had, the summer, I had just submitted my final manuscript, and it had been edited, and they were starting to lay it out. And a collection of letters identified as having belonged to Dudley Saltonstall came up at auction in New Hampshire. And it was the next day that the auction was happening. And I knew I had house guests. I knew I couldn't go to New Hampshire. But the auction house had put online a few of the documents that were to be sold. And one of them was a letter from Dudley Saltonstall. It takes place 30 years after the period of the log books. He's now a man in his late 40s, early 50s, I forget. Uh, he's in Anamabo, in what today is Ghana. He writes home to his wife, Fanny, in New London. He says, I'm going to buy 300 people, and then I'm going to go to South Carolina, and the British are giving me a hard time, and I don't know when I'll be home. Mm. And because the, you know, there were words and references in, these le in this letter and in some of the other letters that were put online that also appear in the log books. Mm -hmm. So I called my editor and I said, I feel safer than ever <laughs> that it is this man who I, who I have said that it is. Sorry, I, I get so excited about it. <laughs> Since reading the book, I can never think of Blake Saltonstall the same way, I have to say. Um, I think we had a comment over here. Chris, if you don't mind bringing the microphone to this gentleman. Yeah, I'm, I'm so excited to read the book. Um, I, I guess I, what I'd love to do is, is take the learning of history and, and bring it forward into the present. I'm curious, uh, my question is, um, how do people receive the book uh, in different areas where you talk about it? Because here in Hartford, you know, we're one of the poorest cities in the nation, uh, but we're surrounded by some of the richest communities in the nation. Um, and I think you know, that history that you're going through has carried forward and, and there's a, you know, a history of ignoring history um, and not talking about that, not talking about redlining, um, not even talking about, you know, consistent redlining that still carries forward in the insurance industry. And, and our communities of color in Hartford and other Connecticut cities have second and third world health and life expectancy discrepancies that are very real. Um, and how do people respond to that history? Do they talk about the present and how that history informs them? I have found, with just a few exceptions, um, 
uh, one of them in a Boston audience last week where I was asked how sure I was about the salt and stall material. Um, uh, I have found almost always audiences are receptive. And I think, you know, my feeling is that if we know our history, if we, if we understood really and truly and fully the way racial prejudice still shapes and governs the access of African Americans to education and to health and to good housing and to all the good things of life, if we understood that that is the legacy of the past, which is my belief, then we could have a different sort of future. And I find that my audiences, and I have to say the book is not a bestseller. I, I, I always bring a lot of books, but I don't usually sell a lot of books. Um, uh, I, I have found my audiences are receptive. And maybe they are self-selected. Someone who is not interested in this is not going to come and hear me speak. Um, does that answer the? Does. How do we take it beyond that self Well, that is, thank you very right. much. This is the question that I wanted to pose, and, and Allegra, I'll ask you um, to start with that. If we know this history now, how does it impact how we go forward? Well, I think um, it, it needs to inform how we look at the problems today. Um, we have to understand that there is an underpinning of um, the subordination of of African American people in particular in our society that goes back to the very beginning. And I think we particularly in the North and in New England in particular have more work to do than other parts of the country who have been forced to, to confront some of these issues and their own history. And that's part of what books like <laughs> ours have, have tried to do is to reclaim. Because during the 19th century there really was a conscious effort to maybe obliterate is going too far, but to consciously forget this past and to really juxtapose the North in contrast with the, the bad South. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're good, they're bad. Mm -hmm. We in the North need to reclaim this history to understand our present and to understand injustice in our society today. Mm -hmm. um, and to make positive changes, I think. Lois, you know that there are going to be a lot of people who say, that was a long time ago. I had nothing to do with that. And so what does this mean to me? Why do I need to do anything? Why should I feel bad? Why should I make changes? Why should I do work in your terms? Well, it's about wanting to be a responsible, knowledgeable, and informed person. It's, a, it's, it's, it's not a matter of, um, there's just so much to know. I, I, wanna, I wanna add to this point though, to come back to that larger question that you were asking about what now. It's also important to recognize that there were communities of color that were in the early insurance business, the mutual beneficent societies. They were taking care. You paid in your money, and that covered your funeral costs if someone lost a job. That, you know, so the models that we have are not unique to white America. They, that truly we have African American histories and inventions and examples that have been absorbed and perhaps overshadowed, but we've been there. And this is also important to recognize that not everybody doesn't know the history. We're not all coming to this for the first time, right? And so part of the engagement that we have to have when somebody says, well, it's not my fault, it's not a matter of fault. It's about actually being a responsible thinking person and trying to say, well, where am I now? And am I curious at all? about the circumstances that have produced the world in which I find myself. And that's for the beautiful and it's for the ugly. It's for the wailing and innovation of various inventions. It's about the light bulb. Every time my child talks about Thomas Edison, we also talk about Louis Latimer, who was the son of an enslaved man who made his way to freedom. And Louis Latimer was a poet and he invented the filament. Why, are we, why don't we hear Edison Latimer, Edison Latimer, but we, we do in our house, right? So it's, but it's that process of wanting to be curious and just saying, what's the other level of history that must have been here? Who else was here? 
It's the asking the question. And I think that's where we begin to start to transform society. It's not about imposing new answers. It's about calling ourselves into a conversation of questions. What do we know about healthcare now? What do we know about it then? What changes were made then? What changes are, can we make now? Because the moment we had enslavement in this country, we had resistance. The moment we had enslavement, we had petitions for freedom. So when W.E.B. Du Bois' great-grandmother, Elizabeth, is in Stockbridge and listening to Massachusetts delegates framing the Massachusetts Constitution, she says, me too. I'm going to get myself a lawyer. And she does. And she sues successfully for her freedom. And that begins to under, um, you know, pull out the, the foundation of enslavement and injustice. Doesn't go away, but we need to know about her too. All right. So it is about the asking of the questions. And I, I wanted to add on, in the colonial period, so we've talked about petitions to state legislatures. Even before we had states, I've found in doing research in court records, there were a relatively large number of suits where people sue for their freedom mm -hmm. and often win, mm -hmm. which is really quite extraordinary, mm -hmm. going back to the early 18th century. And get the courts so, covered in the costs as well. They don't just win their freedom, they also get court costs. <laughs> Do we have other comments or questions people would like to ask? Yes, um, Chris, would you take the microphone over in the back, please? Thank you. There's a sentence from the, from the book that, uh, Anne, when you say, we don't know how damaging slavery was because we don't know our own history and the ways that we need to, and the ways that could help us address our present, still unequal society. Uh, that uh, sentence uh, resonates with me, and I, 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 I think that it, it builds on what the other uh, person had said a few minutes ago. I, I think that one of the uh, reasons that there is the uh, 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 interest in forgetting or suppressing this past uh, suggests to me that the situation was known to be horrendous by the people who lived at that time and for subsequent uh, generations. I mean, it's so difficult uh, that there's a, uh, it, it's, it, it's painful almost to talk about it. And I think if we can't get to that point of recognizing that, we, we don't go forward. And I think earlier you talked about, you know, who speaks for the slaves, because we have a few slave narratives, but things like this help us to understand just how horrendous slavery was and uh, uh, for, for, for the people who were slaves and for those people who held them as slaves knew that this was something that was just terrible. Otherwise, it wouldn't be so difficult to talk about these things in contemporary society. So doing this helps us to talk about some things in order to go forward and make the next steps. I was um, struck by the fact that um, there were so many slaves in this country um, as, you know, as, as the Civil War was about to start, four million enslaved people in this country. Um, I, I even thought that was astonishing, even though I assumed there were, I guess I assumed there were hundreds of thousands, but still four million sounds like so many. It's more people than we have in the entire state of Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the many millions who did not survive the travel in continent, right. Right. the many millions who died en route, and, um, and the numbers are staggering. It's, it's also important, too, in those moments where, you know, we just had the, the end of the Civil War, right? Mm -hmm. That was a really rousing set of celebrations, wasn't it? No, not at all, right? What do we do with the end of the war? That moment of the Emancipation Proclamation, um, people who know me know that I call it the proclamation because it left, a hun it left a million people enslaved. It did not eradicate slavery. It was a military document. We have marked the first firing on at you know, the start of the Civil War, but we haven't come to terms as a nation with what it means to meet the end of the war. That's a place where you say, you lost, we won, and now let's, let's move through that. We did not have that conversation as a country. And that we didn't tells us everything we need to know about the work that needs still to be done. So Booker's point about the pain, I'm also thinking about the pleasure, because that gets complicated when Anne talks about 
um, Maria, Anna, um, Maria. Anna Maria Fal Fal Falkenbridge. I love her name. Yeah. But, but she sounds like a frightening woman because she absolutely can look at enslaved people in that place where they are stuck between heaven and hell. And she can look at it and not be bothered. So it's a, again about the problem. It, it's about there's, it's work. It's work to say, what was that? It's work to say, how do we understand inequity? It's about being an engaged citizen, but it's also about being a responsible and just a humanist, being a human being at heart. So it comes down to, it's not all bad, but it is all there. And you said that um, before you got the assignment from the Hartford Current, you probably could not have told us whether there was even one enslaved person in Connecticut uh, before you started to do the work on this. Um, and yet, the sense that I have is that um, we have chosen to believe that in Connecticut, we were the abolitionists, we were the good guys, we were the guys that were gonna get the Amistad captives freed, and you know it was all gonna be good. Everybody in Farmington was fighting for their rights, and yet, you know, at the Stanley Whitman House in Farmington, they're now starting to incorporate the history of slavery in Farmington um, into their story as being a much bigger story than anyone ever believed it was. We thought there was a handful of people there. Now we think there were hundreds of people there, perhaps. Um, so we sort of buy the, we, we buy the, the personality we want, right? We, we mm. want to be the good guys. We want to be on the right side of the angels. And it makes people uncomfortable when you, as Ben Affleck can, as his life is evidence, it makes you uncomfortable. I was in the uh, House of the Seven Gables last week mm -hmm. uh, taking a tour, and this is a house that was built by a known Caribbean trader, a man who made a fortune, um, and yet captivity, and this house was built in 16, I forget what, it's a 17th century house. Captivity is no part of the narrative at all. And I was touring the house with a bunch of 12-year-olds, and I thought, this is the time to talk about it, you know. And I asked the inter our interpreter, I said, I said, did John Turner own captive people? And she said, he owned indentures. Mm -hmm. She said, his son owned three people, but we don't know anything about them. And I'm thinking, you know, um, Th that's job one. Find out about those three lives. And then when the 12-year-olds are there, you know, just agog at the secret passageways and everything, talk about the people who were part of that house. That's, that's the thing that I always come back to, and that's what's kind of at my marrow, changing the narrative. Mm -hmm. Until we can talk about this. And as Booker says, it makes people uncomfortable. But we have to talk about it. We have to see, you know, that the, uh, you know, Hartford's own story, the marriage Maritime wonderfulness. The other side of that was human oppression. And we can't, we got to have those two stories on the same page. Mm -hmm. And then we can have, I think, a different, a different world. We need to wrap up soon, but I saw we had several comments. So Chris, could you um, take the microphone over there to the woman in the back row? Hi. When I was in high school, all that was mentioned was civil war is, you know, fighting over slavery. Are any of these books or books like them being mandatory reading in middle school and high school these days? Some, there, I, I would like to say there are some, um, there are some efforts to do that. However, um, not so long ago I was in a conversation about the summer reading list for Hartford students. Not a single person of color on the author on the list much less like these kinds of change. stories. So it's, there is so much work to do, but we have to just, I think it's about asking the questions, right? Who's not on this list? Just start with that as your default. Who else lived in this house, right? Mm -hmm. um, who were the servants? Were they always called servants? Were they free to come and go? What were their names? And it's not, we, you know, that we don't know more. It's like, well, don't we want to know more? Um, so this, this whole idea of the access to these narratives, I mean, the Prudence Crandall story from Canterbury, Connecticut, Prudence Crandall and all of her students knew that this was no happy place. Um, and so it's about saying, well, where does the happy story, where's the romance fall down, right? Um, but certainly I think the part of the, I was listening to you and I was thinking archives, CSI, because, <laughs> because you know, the handwriting matches. I, I can confirm this is Give the one. Give them my number. But there is so much excitement to actually bringing these new stories out. So, you know, I think, so in a nutshell, not enough. 
and we need to work on that. But I think public libraries are, are, and our school teachers are doing so much, and we need to, you know, maybe the insurance companies can underwrite a huge project around that. On behalf of the Civil War Commemoration Commission, because I think the, um, the leaders of it, uh, Booker Devon and, and Matt Warshower from CCSU, did show us that um, the war was not really about slavery. It was not really about were the good guys fighting the bad guys. You know, that that was one issue that was in there, but it really wasn't all about that. And also showed us, um, and the one thing I will say for the insurance companies is that one of them did underwrite. Um, we had no money for this commission. There was no state money. We were the only state in the nation that actually had a commission to mark this and had no money designated to it. And one of the insurance companies did come through to underwrite it, and it was in part because of their own past. So I want to give them that. Um, we have a question over here, Chris. The Jackson family, um, just their story is so harrowing, uh, um, being sold, having to try and buy each other back and all that sort of thing. Um, were you surprised looking through court records that, that they were treated so badly in the courts, that, that, that the, the weight of the, the rich guys was so extraordinary? Um, so a question about one of the families, the, the Adam Jackson, the enslaved man in my book, um, his family, um, unfortunately, is um, the subject of litigation among the family that owns them. Mm -hmm. And this puts them through, you know, this throws part of the family back into slavery. But I guess what I came out of that, I mean, I, I don't think I was surprised at how badly they were treated. What I was amazed at, the father of the family it emerges as this incredible patriarch. He fights for the rest of his life for his family, and he is largely successful in reuniting his family. And this is in the first decades of the 18th century. So that's the, you know, John Jackson for me emerged as really an early American hero um, who against all odds, and even using the legal system that had betrayed him to his advantage mm -hmm. um, was, was really extraordinary. Mm -hmm. To have somebody say, well, okay, the person you can have your wife back, but I'm keeping the little one, mm -hmm. the child. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, yeah. people were property. And their interpretation. Um, I think a lot of museums are getting yes. more of the story now. Uh, the Webb House and the Dean House, for example, have for the past at least decade um, really been researching who are the people that lived here, who was working in the kitchen, who was taking care of the children, and have incorporated that. But mm -hmm. I mean, I agree with you. You don't have the story until you know you know, who all the, the interactions were, so. Mm -hmm. And I can see how this has transformed your life, and I find it hard to believe, and I know I had read your work before you wrote um, Complicity. I find it hard to believe that you used to write about things like gardening and entertaining and, you know, those <laughs> lovely, the fluffy pieces. Writer. But the <laughs> fluffy pieces that are. I always turn to first. <laughs> yeah, you still are. I, uh, uh, I, I sometimes use the phrase, or the, as an example, the Bible story about about Paul being knocked off his horse on the road to Damascus. I was very content and making a very nice amount of money writing about houses and orthodontist kitchens and poets and literary figures and sort of not feel, sea captains, feel good stories about Connecticut history, but being exposed to enslavement and seeing it embedded in the landscape and how deep and how big it was. And I thought, I'm nobody. I don't have like special research tools, and I grew up here. How did I not know? And I thought, if I can be changed, and if I can make my life about telling this story, my life will be for something other than, you know, uh, just making money writing about nice houses and gardens. I think that's a wonderful note to end on. And I want to thank all three of you for being here today. Thank I want to you. thank everybody who attended. Um, please tell all your friends who are not able to be here today to look for this on CTN um, and to look for it in the next few days. It'll be on demand on the CTN website because this is a story that we need to continue to tell. Um, if anyone would like to purchase some wonderful books, uh, we can do that for you. We can go right across the hall into the gift shop. And again, thank you so much for coming today. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you.